Hi, I'm David Oleski here in the David Oleski studio in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining me for the 93rd annual Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show online edition. Unfortunately, we could not be in beautiful Rittenhouse Square Park this weekend, but we are here to make sure you're not only entertained, but enlightened and inspired, because that's what art should do. It should inspire you. So I'm going to uh, do a little painting here, uh, just uh, literally a little painting, and uh, I'll get a few things started. I'll give you a tour of my studio. At any time, you can go to the David Oleski website. I don't know if that's broadcasting backwards or forwards, but uh, that says davidoleski.com. That's D-A-V-I-D-O-L-E-S-K-I. Oleski from the original Olszewski, which is an ancient Nordic word for exalted being of light and goodness. But uh, that's neither here nor there. So what I'm doing here, uh, you, you know, you may uh, have heard, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with my work, my booth is normally on the corner of Walnut and Rittenhouse. Some people call me the apple guy, but don't ever call me the apple guy. So uh, today, just uh, I'm going to do a, a small painting of, uh, uh, you can see here, a, an apple and uh, on this small canvas. And uh, I don't know what you'd rather be looking at to see what I'm doing on the canvas or, or how I'm mixing the color, uh, probably how I'm mixing the color to get started. Teach you a little bit about my color theory because uh, everything I do is about the color. All right, can you see the palette? There you go. So, uh, I don't know if you can see it there. You can uh, see, yeah, almost everything. Let me just move this a little bit more. Shortcomings of technology, what are you gonna do? So I work with what's called the split six, which is a warm and cool version of each of the three complementary colors. I've got a warm and cool version of yellow, lemon yellow and cadmium yellow, a warm and cool of red, cadmium red and alizarin crimson, warm and cool of blue, cobalt blue and ultramarine blue, but then it's augmented with a warm and cool version of green, phthalo green and permanent green light and white. As you'll see, there's no earth tones, there's no black, there's no umbers, there's no Naples yellow. And from these key primary colors, I can get the entire range of, of everything I, I do. Um, you know, and, and just not being afraid to start with some really extreme colors just to get some uh, fairly subtle transitions. Like what I do is I hold the knife up next to what I'm trying to mix and uh, do as close of approximation. And then when I have the color I want, just set it aside. And, uh, and the whole painting kind of just starts out that way. I mean, I, you know, mixing the, the shadow and just grabbing blue and just saying, yeah, it's basically a cool shadow and you build up the volume of it with your white and then uh, before you know it you have a fairly neutral muted gray you know on your night well shazam i'm like right on it today whoa i'm like firing on all eight cylinders If anybody has any questions, just uh, go ahead and pipe up. John Maurer, Kerry Sacco, what's happening to the Rehoboth Show? I don't know what's happening to the Rehoboth Show. It's just going online. And hello from Kutztown, Pennsylvania. Sean Huntington, how are you? And uh, yeah, so. Uh, Yeah, just keep mixing colors, setting them aside.
So I learned an interesting thing just a few minutes ago that Facebook does not do widescreen mode. It only broadcasts in portrait mode. So all of the problems everybody's been having with streaming on Facebook Live is because they're just knocking their heads against that one limitation. Alright, so I think we're just about ready to start throwing some paint around here. It's really important that you maintain your materials. You have to keep your brushes cleaned after every session so that you can quickly bring them right back to life. I use Robert Simmons Sinet series, specifically the Filbert. Um, and of course, this is oil paint. I, uh, that's why I'm using the, the solvent, and this is why I'm using the medium, the turpentine. So I want to just reorient this here so you can see what I'm doing on the easel. Kind of like something like this. And then, uh, all right, you ready to watch this? It's going to happen really fast, so don't blink. All right then, so uh, I think we're about done. Oh, no, that's right, color. I forgot about that part. All right, so uh, here we go. So I already mixed the, uh, the color of the background and just to uh, let you in on a little secret, I like to find as much darkness and depth in my background colors so that the subject itself, it's really easy to carve out the volume that helps it to bloom and emerge out of the darkness of the background. That's just a little thing I do, and it just kind of works for me. You might have your own system, and I applaud you in that. Oh, look at that. And really, just the fastest you can get that thing covered, the better. Just slug the paint on there. There's no extra points for grace, beauty, delicacy, any of those things. I always try to find a different color to the background than I do to the foreground. When technically there really isn't a background or foreground in the painting, it's all part of the painting and it's all part of the compositional elements that help to make a believable image. And that's what's important to understand that there's not just components to the image, it's all the painting. There's not a foreground, background, subject. It all just works together, which is just the beauty of it when you really think of it that way. And look at the size of the brush that I'm using to do this little tiny painting. That's how little I care about being dainty and delicate. The biggest brush you can do, just hog it on there. Just don't worry about it. It's all just great. It just doesn't matter. And then we'll switch over to the little tiny brush for the little tiny stem and the little tiny mark. Just like that. One happy little apple. 
gosh darn it. I just, I suddenly feel just so warm and fuzzy when it just comes together like this. You have no idea. It's just the joy of, of when an apple looks, never mind. I, uh, yeah, so uh, just like that. And there you go. So uh, as I said, it all happens pretty quickly. Don't blink or you'll miss it. For a reference mark, I'll just throw in the highlight with whatever white happens to be nearby. Of course, it's uh, not sticking now because everything else is too wet. So just even lay it in there just for a reference for the highlight, which gives me the foundation to start really thinking about carving out more details, finding more resolution. I mean, there's all kinds of really exciting color transitions that I can keep exploring. You know, I always say the painting doesn't start until the entire thing is covered with paint. So I'm, I'm no longer looking at any of the, the white canvas. I don't see any underpainting, nothing. The entire thing is completely covered. So this is when the, the painting really begins. Not when you're putting your first marks down and you still have white canvas staring at you. Get the entire thing covered as quickly as you can. And uh, so now, once the whole thing's covered, I'll go in and scrape out a section and then lay in the correction of the color that I just mixed. Try to avoid mixing wet into wet. Of course, for this demonstration, all of my personal self-discipline goes right out the window and I'm just trying to not make a total fool out of myself, but uh, it's probably a little late for that now, isn't it? Um, all right, so that's uh, the long and short of it. I'll just keep working with smaller and smaller brushes. I'll keep finding more and more of the interesting transitions. Like, uh, for instance, you know, where it's just two colors that go straight into each other. This would be an excellent chance to find what might be considered a fairly high voltage green. And if you mix it just right, we'll sit right there where it belongs. And no, this is not a, uh, an art show t-shirt I'm using as a paint rag. Just in case you were wondering, where do you get such a nice bright white paint rags? Yeah, so... Yeah, so by the time I'm done, I will have defined all of these contours and edges and every color that's going around and the reflection, the shadow that's being cast from the stem. I'll, I'll carve in details. I'll sharpen up every blurry line. All the mud will have been removed and replaced with a cleaner, purer, brighter color because it's all about the color. Color's everything. All right, so what time is it? Gosh, who would like a tour of my studio? It is, uh, it's quarter after. Okay, maybe this is a nice time to take a quick tour of the studio. I'm going to, uh, can I, oh, there I go. Reverse this thing to the other side. There's my view. There's the hostas my wife planted for me. And here you go. This is where I work. I've got some of my work on display. I've got a seat over there where you can see I, I, I sit. And then there, there's uh, the, the uh, stairway to, to heaven, some might call it. Here's, uh, here's where I stand to paint. This is the view I have looking back and forth, back and forth. And I'm just standing here all the time. I never sit down to paint. I only ever actually stand. I've been standing for 20 years at this, uh, doing this. I never sit down when I paint. I sit down to look at it. But uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, 
So here you can see some of the, the work I have on display here behind me is a uh, beautiful abstract. And uh, there you go, everything's backwards, wow. That's one of my earlier abstract color fields. And uh, then over here, this is a more recent piece where I'm doing a much more uh, stronger co horizontal compositional element. And then this piece back here is uh, some real stunning colors, a real massive size. And uh, this is the, uh, the obligatory wet bar uh, with uh, a place I can wash my hands and uh, you know, it's a real nice little space here. And, uh, and uh, yeah, there's, there's uh, my, my little plant in the window because everybody needs to have a plant in the window. And uh, oh gosh, look at that. And uh, you know, I gotta tell you, that there's, a, there's a window right here and I, I believe it says actually a bedroom and at the right time of day, if I stand here, there's a woman that I can see in there. And then I, then I realize, oh, that's, that's actually my house. Oh, that's, that's my wife in that window. So yeah, so nice little space here. I actually built this entire studio myself, actually raised these walls. Uh, someday maybe I'll share the video if you're up for some colorful language to say the least. And uh, somebody is cutting the grass. I'd like to take a tour outside of the garden and I have a, a few pieces of work on display out there, but uh, I don't know how loud that lawnmower is going to be for us, but let's just give it a try. All right, here we are going outside. And does anybody have any questions so far? Let me just check here and, uh, oh, do I use a complementary color to neutralize? Oh, yes, I do. Ja? Oh, it's pretty already. Cup and crap. And, uh, okay. Yes, there's a pretty girl outside. Yes, I do need a dog. Hanukkah, very welcome for sharing. Tanya, nice studio. Thank you, Tanya. All right, so here, let's take a walk outside. Oh, it's warm out here. So beautiful uh, flowers and uh, that my wife has planted. A nice little stone wall. And uh, oh my gosh, look at this. This looks like the, uh, the booth of David Oleski. Look at that. All right, well, hey, let's, uh, let's go in and have a look around. So you saw how the... Uh... Oh, yeah, we are going to have somebody cutting the grass here. I want to flip this around so I can narrate what you're looking at with a better camera. There you go. This is 11 apples, 40 inches by 60 inches. So you can see it's a much, much larger than the five inch by seven inch painting that was in there, but the exact same methodology is in place of how the colors are scraped out and reworked and remixed. And just every color is just made brighter and stronger as the painting develops. And here we see a, uh, smaller version of just three apples. Again, finding the, uh, the transition colors from red into green. It's always a challenge. Just something that's vivid red to vivid green, which are complementary colors that cross right to each other without ever forming a dead gray. Here's a brand new painting of black plums now, that was a challenging painting. You can't imagine how hard it is to mix something that's so vividly dark and black. That you start with all of the darkest colors and then find the haze, find the reflection, find the atmosphere. And uh, that's just really, really challenging. And then uh, there's a painting of red tulips. This is also a brand new painting. 
and just reducing things down to exactly what I see and how I see and finding all of the highlights in the glass and then right here you'll see a nice painting of sunflowers this is 30 inches by 40 inches this would look great in your entry hallway right above your sideboard there's actually a video about the making of this painting on my website if you get a chance tune into the website and you can see the step-by-step -step process plus time lapse of this painting coming together plus it's kind of entertaining these are two brand new paintings black grapes and of course two apples but you can see on the black grapes just like with the plums essentially they're black but you'll see some of the the sheen and the the darkness and the haze and so much that's that's like not black but it still reads as black and that just comes through observation and just work it rework it and just keep finding everything you can find in there here's a few paintings like the tiny one that was on the easel they're finished there's there's three sardines on a dish there's a red plum and that's an heirloom tomato i'm not sure what makes an heirloom tomato an heirloom it doesn't really get handed down for generations it just gets eaten but who am i to uh argue with what people call so uh these are some older paintings and then uh yeah, just a different exploration completely different colors of grapes green grapes it's more of a study of yellow and blue than it is of green and somebody let me know if that lawnmower is too loud and if that's annoying well, look at that there's my lovely wife running away to avoid being on camera hi sweetie oh she looks so nice oh my gosh and then uh yeah here look at that that's a nice painting just vivid even though these pears come out of the same bag and one just had a slightly reddish tint to it just the more you explore, the more you can extrapolate so much variety from one subject to the next. And then there is a vine ripened tomato, 30 inches by 40 inches vertical. Now this would fit perfectly on that one wall that you just can't seem to find anything that's going to work. So this was all of my, my still life work, whereas here you can see some more of the abstract color fields. This is from a, uh, a big gallery show I had last year. These are uh, two smaller pieces for people that love the abstract work but don't, can't afford the space to have it be actually immersive. Now there's an older piece, some kind of interesting combination of pastel colors. And then uh, I find that the uh, 30 by 60 inch wide size is, is really nice to explore elements of landscape in these color fields. And then this is an interesting combination of uh, lavender and, and violet. A lot of mid-tones of earth tones. And uh, right over here is the last one. Is uh, another one. So I'd love to give you a tour of the rest of the property and the pond, but I'm afraid my Wi-Fi connection may start to fail and I would just hate it if we lost connection in the middle of the grand tour. So how about we take a walk back up to the uh, studio here and I'll uh, address any questions anybody might have. It's just such a beautiful day. It's just beautiful here in the forest. Look at this. It's just a beautiful place to be. Uh-huh. 
So I do need a cat. We have a bit of a chipmunk problem. I mean, I love chipmunks, but gosh, there's just so many of them here. All right, so uh, we're back in here. An heirloom tomato is a cultivated, super tasty brand. That's a good branding. That, that's somebody that really knew what they were doing to make something more valuable. Because it was all about the perceived value. Like you can see how quickly I made this painting come together, but the perceived value of the finished product is what is called marketing. So uh, I guess I'll just paint a little more unless anybody has any specific questions. Oh, thank you, Pook. So back to this. The interesting thing is to sometimes find a color like cadmium yellow straight from the tube. There's actually in some of these transition colors is almost pure cadmium yellow. It's maybe muted with the tiniest bit of uh, phthalo green. Yeah, but uh, it's just absolutely vivid. Now well, that's what's exciting to me when you're painting something as mundane as a golden delicious apple that has a transition from red to green, yet as you're working, you're discovering that there's some really, really vivid colors within what, I mean, it goes from red to green, so you would think in the middle would be gray. Instead, it's just this ultra vivid color. To me, that's what makes it all worthwhile. So is there any questions? Oh, somebody has a cat for rent. Good. As much as I'd like to own a cat, we have travel plans and I just hate to park a cat like it's a house plant and say, we'll be back. There's your food. There's the door to the outside. But it would be nice to have an animal around the property. And it's just the same process throughout the entire painting. And sometimes a color that already got mixed, scraped out and mixed again, gets scraped out again and corrected again. Just because it's not about the one color, it's about the color relationships. It's about every color around it. And even after everything on the entire shape has been rendered, I'll go in and just articulate the transitions that are happening in the ta tabletop around the edge of this. And it will create a volume in the subject itself without even actually painting on the subject itself, just by articulating the air around it, by exploring what else can you find within these shadows, within this color around it within the reflection on the tabletop. The more time and focus you put on every single part of this painting, the more you're going to create the depth and space 
that makes it a believable subject. So maybe this was helpful. Oh, do you want to see a close-up of it? Sure. Here you go. I'm not sure if that's a nice view of it. It's odd, I don't know how to make the, oh, there is a way, there's a, something in settings to make this all not backwards, but that would have to have happened before I started broadcasting. So right now you can see it's pretty hoggish. It's all just slugged out. But uh, I can grab a painting and show you up close what it's going to look like. Just excuse me for a moment while I come over here and uh, grab this painting. This is still a fairly small painting, but uh, give you an idea of what this is eventually going to be like on a smaller level. So again, you can see how the uh, the reds and pinks transition to grays and greens, but they stay fairly vivid. And then the one that's all green becomes a celebration of blues and some really muted colors. But altogether, it does read as the shapes it's supposed to be. Just with a patchwork of color. And you can see when I get closer to resolving it, I don't really blend the wet colors into each other. I allow the brush strokes to stay separate. I personally like to allow the mark of the human hand to exist in the final painting. Some people might say that's actually my style, but I learned in art school that a style is actually the mark that your hand naturally makes that you fall back on as a crutch, as opposed to keep reinvent how you see and how you're going to portray what you see. And don't fall into those simple marks that your hand naturally makes, but attempt to override that and actually embrace how you perceive it. Allow it to be cerebral, not the physical mark, if that makes any sense. So, I don't know, what time is it? Oh, we still got 10 minutes. Okay, any other questions here? Oh, hoggish, I'm stealing that. Yes, you can steal that. Oh, and Julie, my neighbor from across the pond is watching. I can see her house from here. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I would have loved to have given you a tour of the entire property and the pond but as I said, I don't know that the Wi-Fi would have worked the whole way down there. You could have met the, uh, the geese and the, we have a giant snapping turtle that calls the place home. And maybe we'd, we would have been lucky enough to see the giant water snake, which is always exciting. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, I'll work on this a little bit more unless some other questions come up. And the first day of the painting, the, uh, the paints, it's really juicy and wet. Just in a few hours, it will set up enough and it will start to, it'll have a drag to it. And that's where you can really start building up your surface and where the, the brush strokes really become articulated because you've, it, it's, you know, it becomes more like uh, as if viscosity changes as it dries a little bit, it just sets up. Um, and then it's, you know, it's fun to work it when it's like that. Right now it's still very fluid. I mean, with a rag, I could probably wipe this whole thing down to uh, a white canvas again, but just, you know, in a few hours, this will have set up to the point that, uh, 
it starts to really feel like paint. You start to really feel the drag on the brush. And, uh, you know, that's when you, uh, you know, before you know it, the painting's done. I mean, you don't want to overwork it. You want to, uh, like I said, allow the mark of the human hand to, to still be evident in the final piece. I mean, I think that's what uh, probably separates professional artists from a lot of uh, hobbyists, that they don't have a deadline, so they'll just keep rendering it and then wonder why is there no life in it, because you've just rendered the life out of it. So, uh, you know, having the deadline, knowing I need to get this painting done and wrap it up because I have a show, I'm going to leave, I'm definitely not going to be able to work on this again next week, that that brevity and panache leaves the painting with a life that is what makes it attractive. So a lot of people that are learning how to paint, you know, a good little deadline to make is set up 10 canvases, 10 canvases and say, I will cover all of these 10 canvases and then I'll sit back and look at all 10 of them. So that on the first one, it's like, ah, wrap it up. Do the second one. You'll learn more on that. And it's like, oh, you could make it better, but use what you've learned on the third one and finish that one. And trying to get that brevity and efficiency of marks down really goes a long way to keeping that lively, fluid look that, you know, people respond to. People want to see what another person has done, not something that was just rendered with endless time until there's no air left in it. You know, there are realist painters that do render things and, and that's great. And, and some of them maintain great color, great movement, great emotion. But for me and what I do and the way I do it, it's never going to be polished. It's never going to be uh, super finished. But there is a surface that, uh, yeah, it's got a, a, a richness to it and, and an integrity that, that I really respond to with my own work. I love my own work. Uh, you know, not to sound like uh, I'm totally uh, complete. You know, I, I constantly feel like I should be doing better and everything I do should be a step forward. And, but I always say to myself, whatever I've learned on this, wrap it up you can learn more on the next painting. Whatever you've used, you can apply it to what you're doing next. So, uh, medium. I'm using uh, uh, Stand Oil. I don't know if you can see my shelf of materials here. I, I use Stand Oil and real turpentine. And it's just so it's got the viscosity of motor oil or so, and then just by it being open, it winds up setting up. So by the end of the painting, it's got a heavier body and the ratio probably has changed. Uh, you move the camera down so you can see me mix the colors. Sure. Um, uh, more about the relationship of my color field work. They're both based on observation, that they're, they're both about rendering a color space and uh, I'm not sure if I can uh, get this down so you can see the palette as much. I'm about to run out of time here, but I can just show you really quickly. What time is it? Yeah, we got five minutes. Yeah, that's enough. Can you see the? Yeah, there you go. So. So whenever I have a color, I set it aside. I've already used that color to lay in the one hot spot, but it, that will be what I pull from when I'm mixing one of the next colors, like to find the color that's underneath it. it I could stop with just a combination of some yellows and reds, but what I like to do within that volume underneath the apple is to, for some reason, ultramarine blue tends to capture the color of volume. So coming up with a muted cool gray like this. And by itself, not sure if you can see, as I put it here, 
That is absolutely not the color I'm going to want on there. But in combination with this other color I've already mixed, the two of those together, yeah. Here, let me show you what happens when I put that on the canvas. Where's that camera person when I need them? So I'm talking about this color underneath here. Scrape out that and then lay this in. It's real soft, subtle difference, but it just creates a glow reflecting off of the tabletop to underneath there. And right next to it will be a different version of this that's reflecting a different part of the tabletop. That all of these colors are going to have something to do with what's behind it and what's reflecting around the edges. Like I use the illustration, think of a, uh, a mirrored Christmas ball. You're seeing all of the colors of the room around the edge and only in the center are you seeing some of the brightest colors, including yourself that everything is a reflection of what's around it. So everything, even if it's not high gloss, is still capturing colors from the atmosphere around it, which is the nature of Impressionism, that everything is, is affect, all of the colors are affected by atmosphere, reflection, uh, distance, uh, just so many, uh, you know, so many things to consider when mixing each of these colors. So I think I'm probably just about out of time here. Is there any more questions? Am I always on the lookout for subject matter? Oh, Kevin, talented and handsome. Gosh, you're just too cute. Um, I always wind up coming back to fruit just because it's just so vividly colorful. Um, you know, and flowers for the, for the same reason. They're just... Uh, you know, something that's just such vivid colors just really stretches what you can do with, a, you know, with, with my palette. Um, you know, both the, uh, both the, the still lifes and the abstracts, they're both based on the same color sense, the same color theory. I, uh, you know, I'm continually mixing and matching and referencing. You know, a lot of the abstract color fields are, uh, you know, they look like just a, a, you know, a cacophony of, of color, but th there's just so many, uh, yeah, I mean, very specifically, you know, finding very particular colors that are going to work together to, to resonate and create a harmony. Um, do I do larger still lifes? Yes, I do do larger still lifes. I, I would rather work large, but uh, this small one here was uh, manageable for this uh, this demonstration. And then uh, the uh, I did just get a uh, email from uh, somebody that saw me last July. They're interested in uh, a painting of eggshells, which uh, I'd love to revisit. Finding just white eggshells and setting them on a white tabletop and then realizing there's a lot more color than just a white eggshell and a white tabletop. So that probably will be one of the next paintings. So maybe I'll make a short film about it. So make sure you tune into the website. That's uh, davidoleski.com. You can uh, do a, a screen capture and then mirror this to see it properly because I know it's backwards. Or you can visit me on Facebook as uh, Facebook.com David Oleski or uh, Instagram David Oleski or on YouTube it's it's YouTube.com slash David Oleski and on Twitter I think it's probably uh, Twitter.com slash David Oleski and if you want to just email me it's David Oleski at David Oleski because you know all things eventually return to David Oleski. Thank you for tuning in and uh, be good to each other. Everybody stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, hopefully we'll be back in the park in September. And uh, 
stop by and say hello. Tune in. There's going to be another artist right after me. It'll be just as exciting. And, uh, and that's about that. So, uh, all right then. Thank you, everybody.